Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for joining the clinical case review live stream event today. I'm Dr. Jim Jennings. I am Executive Medical Director for Quality Provider Development and Innovation for Norton Medical Group. Um, the clinical case review is a monthly live stream program that takes place on the second Wednesday of the month at noon. The series provides a clinical case review followed by discussion and will highlight evidence-based practices in the management and treatment of adult patients, and in this case, also pediatrics. Participants will receive a link following the program for an evaluation. You can also use the QR code that will be displayed following the live stream today. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lisa Folsom. Dr. Folsom is an assistant professor of pediatrics with an associate appointment in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Louisville. She is board certified in both adult and pediatric endocrinology and provides endocrine and diabetes cares for a patient of all ages. She has a special interest in caring for transgender patients, as well as easing the transition from pediatric to adult care for patients with type 1 diabetes and other chronic endocrine conditions. Very much appreciate Dr. Folsom's um, interest in providing that transition as someone who has tried to work on that um, transition program for over five years when I was overseeing adult primary care. It's really very much needed service, so I very much appreciate Dr. Folsom. So um, thanks for joining us, Dr. Folsom. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. I'm going to share my screen and we will go ahead and get started. Okay, if you cannot see this, please let me know. Otherwise, we will go ahead and get started. Um, I am delighted to be able to talk with everyone today about diabetes ketoacidosis and how to identify and manage. So we will go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Dr. Jennings, for that wonderful introduction and for everyone um, who's here joining us today. I have no relevant relationships, uh, financial or otherwise, to disclose. And let's talk about what we're gonna be talking about during our time together. First, I want us to really be able to develop a clinical acumen for when to suspect DKA. As we will talk about during this presentation, DKA is often diagnosed with, with, with no previous history of diabetes. So it's really important to have a high index of suspicion. We'll also talk about how to recognize the clinical manifestations of DKA and then apply the diagnostic criteria for DKA to the patients that we might encounter, whether that's in the outpatient or the inpatient setting. And then finally, I want us all to be able to expertly manage DKA. DKA is something that, that is managed by a multitude of different healthcare providers. From, from the medical assistant to the triage person who, who first encounters the patient, to the nurses and the dietitians and the certified diabetes education specialist, nurse practitioners and doctors, we all play a part. And so we'll talk about how we can all expertly manage this diagnosis. We are gonna start out with a clinical case. And as Dr. Jennings mentioned, I practice both adult and pediatric endocrinology. And so we're gonna talk about someone who's right on the edge of both an 18-year-old male who presented to the emergency room with fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Very common complaints that we see in our practice from day to day. This individual had a past medical history of asthma, and he admitted that he really hadn't been to the doctor very often, hadn't, hadn't had a, a lot of routine medical care in the time being. He wasn't on any medications at home, and be that because he wasn't prescribed any, wasn't taking any, or hadn't been to the doctor. And when we examined our patient, he, he didn't look super healthy. He had a, a low BMI of 16.4 kilograms per meter squared. He was febrile with a temperature of 101.7. He was tachycardic with a pulse of 121. His blood pressure was a little low, 92 over 51. He was breathing rapidly and his oxygen saturation was only 88% on room air. In general, he just didn't appear very comfortable. He had some nasal flaring and he looked dehydrated based on mucous membrane evaluation. As I mentioned, his heart rate was elevated. 
He had rapid, deep breathing on respiratory exam, and he was diffusely tender to palpation with hypoactive bowel sounds. His cap refill was delayed, and he had cool fingers and toes. His skin had decreased turgor and was generally dry. And on neuro exam, although he was awake and alert and oriented, he did appear anxious. So because this is an online presentation, I don't want you to fall asleep or, or wander off. And so I have created some interactive questions. And so let's go ahead and talk about what our initial evaluation we should do with this patient. And you can, you can pick one or all of these options. And once we have some answers collected, we'll talk about the results and, and what we should do. All right, so we have, we have many great answers. We have some people who want to get some more history. Uh, maybe we should check a complete blood count. Maybe we should get electrolytes and maybe we should do a COVID test. And, and I agree with everyone. I think that, that, that doing everything is the correct answer. And so that's what I would recommend doing is, is getting a little bit more information. So let's get some more information. This kid slash young adult reports that he's been more thirsty. He's been urinating more frequently about two to three times per week before he presented, or excuse me, frequently for the per first, uh, the, the past two to three weeks before I admitted the admission. He had said that, you know, mom had been needing to buy more Gatorade. He'd been drinking six to eight bottles of this every day. And he's also been getting up at least twice overnight to urinate, which was not normal for him. Now, he did recall that he had been exposed to COVID the week before his grandmother had been diagnosed. And he also reported that the shortness of breath he'd been having had developed more recently, just about two to three days before admission. So what is the most likely explanation for his symptoms? Is it he's just not super active, so he's not, um, he's, de he's deconditioned. Maybe he has acute COVID. Maybe he has elevated serum glucose, or maybe he's just been drinking too much Gatorade. What do you guys think is, is the most likely explanation for all the symptoms that he's reported to us this far? Okay, fantastic. So some people say he's got COVID. 81% um, answered elevated serum glucose and 13% answered excessive consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. So I agree with the majority. I think that most of his symptoms are related to an elevated serum glucose. And so let's talk about this. Let's talk about diabetes. I think one of the, the most notable facts about diabetes is that although almost 10% of the U.S. population has been diagnosed with or has diabetes, almost 30% of these cases are undiagnosed. So 8.1 million people who have diabetes don't know that they have it. So again, this is something we have to have a high index of suspicion in order to identify. One of the reasons this is so important is that diabetes is a deadly disease. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. But because there are so many patients who are undiagnosed, only about a third of those who have diabetes have this listed as either a cause or a contributing factor to their death. So it's really important that we as healthcare providers are able to identify this diagnosis and treat it. So how, how do we do that? How is diabetes discovered? And there's really three main ways that we find out somebody has diabetes. One is just incidental hyperglycemia. They're noted to have high blood sugar, either when they come in for their routine physical exam, maybe they have a relative with diabetes who says, oh, let's just check your blood sugar. Or maybe they're enrolled in a research trial and as part of the intake visit, they're having some lab work done which reveals hyperglycemia. Maybe they present with those classic symptoms, the polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, all the things that we learn about as we're training and the diagnosis is made. 
or maybe they present in DKA and 25 to 40% of patients with newly diagnosed present this way in diabetic ketoacidosis. So let's talk about DKA. DKA is almost 200 years old and a diabetes coma was first described by August W. von Stotch in 1828. Now I should clarify, DKA is much more than 200 years old, but the description of it was first mentioned in 1828. And this gentleman described an adult who presented with severe polydipsia, polyuria, and significant glucose in the urine. And as we didn't have insulin at this time, the patient had a, a very devastating clinical course and progressed to mental decline and finally death. After this initial case was reported, several case reports followed, adding additional information, including this peculiar breath odor resembling acetone. And this is where we began to, to clue into the ketone aspect of DKA. We're talking about hyperglycemic emergencies and specifically DKA because this is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in our patients who have diabetes. There are two main hyperglycemic emergencies, DKA, which is, is present in about four to eight episodes per 1,000 hospital admissions. And there were just over 220,000 hospital admissions for DKA in 2017. So this is a big deal. 67% of those admitted with DKA have known type 1 diabetes, but that means that a third of them do not. The other hyperglycemic emergency that deserves its own presentation, so we won't be spending much time about uh, on this today, is the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, or HHS. And this is about 1% of diabetes-related admissions, and 90% of these cases are in individuals with known type 2 diabetes. So the clinical presentation, the pathophysiology between these two is different. But as I mentioned, we're focusing on DKA. So who should we suspect? When should we have this high clinical index of suspicion? And this is an article that was published in the journal Diabetes and Metabolic Syndrome. They looked at DKA cases between the two years, 2015 to 2017. And they looked at the, the, the breakdown. They found that 60% of these cases were in patients with new onset type 1 diabetes, never knew that they had diabetes until they were admitted to the hospital in DKA. 27% of these cases were in those with type 2 diabetes. And interestingly, most of these cases had some sort of coexisting infection. And we'll talk about why this might be the case. 10% had known type 1 diabetes, and the most likely reason for their admission was omitting insulin, either intentionally or unintentionally. And then 3% of those cases were unknown. So again, 60% new onset diabetes, never knew they had diabetes. So you can't rely on history of diabetes as a factor towards including this in your differential diagnosis. DKA itself is a pretty deadly condition. When we look at DKA, we find that the mortality is approximately 1%, which doesn't seem like a whole lot until you remember that per year, there's over 220,000 cases of DKA. So a good majority of these patients are going to die. DKA is also expensive. It costs the healthcare system about $6.76 billion per year in healthcare related costs. And so not only is this devastating for our patients in regards to mortality, it also places an increased tax on the healthcare system. So identifying, preventing, and treating this case is helpful for us in all aspects. So back to our clinical case. Our patient, as we mentioned, needs some more laboratory evaluation. We do a CBC, which reveals leukocytosis. His renal function panel reveals a sodium of 122, slightly elevated potassium, very low bicarb, elevated BUN and creatinine, and a glucose level of 865. We do a venous blood cast, which reveals a pH of 7.02. Urinalysis is positive for both glucose and ketones, and micro studies reveal a positive COVID PCR. So what is the most likely diagnosis for our patient? Does he have COVID? Is this an asthma exacerbation? Is this a urinary tract infection? 
or is this diabetic ketoacidosis? Thinking back about the whole clinical picture, the symptoms, the labs, the physical exam, all of the evidence. Okay, we have 100% correct response. This patient absolutely has DKA. And, and I love that you put this all together based on the symptoms and the laboratory evidence, and I wasn't able to confuse us with the COVID. So our patient has DKA. What, what is going on? Let's talk about energy and insulin and glucose and glucagon and how this all factors in. So let's talk about the body. We need glucose to function. And so you can see this very sad muscle cell down on the left-hand side of the screen, and he, he needs some energy. And so a person without diabetes will ingest carbohydrates, which bind to the beta cell and stimulate the beta cell to release insulin. This insulin then goes to the muscle cell, binds to it, and allows the glucose inside. Once we have glucose in the cell, the cell can turn this into energy. And so this is the way that our bodies normally function. However, what if there's no insulin? What if those beta cells, as the case, the case in, in uh, type 1 diabetes, don't make insulin? Well, our bodies are pretty smart. And even though glucose is the preferred fuel, we can make ketones to kind of get us through these periods of, of insulin deficiency. So we make ketones, which is our alternate but less effective energy source, and we produce ketones both in states of prolonged fasting and lack of sufficient insulin. So looking at our picture here, we have the pancreas, which in a state of low glucose, both decreases insulin secretion and increases glucagon secretion. This decrease in insulin, increase in glucagon causes the fat cells to release fatty acids, which go to the liver and based on the stimulation of glucagon are converted into ketones. This is that ketogenesis process. And then the ketones go into the bloodstream and allow the body to have energy, even though it's not the glucose energy. So let's talk about the balance then, the balance between glucose and insulin. We'll start at the top of the screen in a state of high blood sugar, and we'll follow the yellow arrows first. When we have high blood sugar, this promotes the pancreas to release insulin. And as we mentioned before, insulin stimulates the uptake of glucose from the blood, both in our tissue cells, which lowers the blood sugar because the glucose is going inside, and then it also stimulates the liver to turn that extra glucose into glycogen and store it for later. So now we've decreased the glucose and we're in a state of, of, of lower blood sugar. So we're down at the bottom of the screen now. We'll follow the green arrows. The state of low blood sugar instead of insulin causes the pancreas to make glucagon. Glucagon then goes to the liver and causes the breakdown of glycogen into glucose, which then raises the blood sugar. So we have this beautiful balance of power between insulin and glucagon to control the glucose in our blood. But when we have no insulin, this balance is upset. And this is where diabetic ketoacidosis comes in. Because type one diabetes is a state of insulin deficiency. The body doesn't make insulin. This is much more common in individuals with type one diabetes, but it can also happen in patients with type two diabetes. Let's break down the terminology a little bit. The diabetes part of DKA is related to the hyperglycemia. When we have no insulin, blood sugar goes up and states of hyperglycemia cause dehydration because of glucose urea and fluid follows glucose in the urine. The ketoacidosis part, this is really important, relates to the ketones. So the state of insulin deficiency causes breakdown of fatty acids, which we, as we mentioned, are converted into ketones in the liver. And this acidosis is caused by the ketones combined with the dehydration from the hyperglycemia. So you have to have diabetes and a state of ketoacidosis for DKA to exist. There is a poor association between the degree of acidosis and hyperglycemia. So if we're thinking about DKA, the acidosis piece, the pH, the bicarb level, that's much more significant as far as the clinical status of the patient compared to the blood sugar level all by itself. 
Well, why does DKA happen? What are some reasons? What are some precipitating factors that we should think about when we're encountering a patient in whom we suspect DKA? Inadequate insulin. Someone can't take insulin or doesn't take insulin or isn't making insulin. States of infection. There are certain medical conditions, including infection, acute coronary syndrome, and cerebrovascular accidents, as well as pulmonary embolism. All of these things cause increased stress on the body, which leads to insulin resistance. So although the body might be making some insulin, as is in the case with type 2 diabetes, the degree of insulin resistance causes a relative insulin deficiency, and DKA can occur. Other conditions like pancreatitis, the pancreas is so inflamed that you can't make sufficient insulin. Situations like alcohol or other substance abuse, which increases ketone production and dehydration in and of itself can precipitate DKA. So all of these things are important to include in our history taking when we're encountering patients. We'll talk a little bit more about a specific type of medication, SGLT2 inhibitors later on, but there are other medications that can also precipitate DKA, so ensuring we're taking a good history, including medications, is important as well. So what do our patients look like? What are some signs or symptoms that could clue us in that DKA might be approaching? Neurologic signs like lethargy, confusion, or headache. Signs of decreased perfusion like hypothermia, patients with abdominal pain and vomiting related to ketones, tachycardia and hypotension, that classic rapid deep breathing through small respirations, papilledema can indicate cerebral edema, that fruity breath mentioned in our earlier case reports from the 1800s, and signs of dehydration or decreased perfusion like cool extremities and slow capillary refill. We make the diagnosis based on biochemical evidence. DKA can be broken down into mild, moderate, or severe, but let's start in the mild column because DKA is DKA. An arterial pH of at least 7.25, a serum bicarb of 18 or lower, urine ketones that are detectable, serum ketones that are detectable if they're measured, the osmolality is not as indicative of DKA as it is in HHS, an elevated anion gap. Now, when we look at the moderate and severe categories, we just see that the acidosis becomes more severe. The bicarb is lower. So keeping in mind the mild criteria can help make the diagnosis in anyone with DKA. So back to our patient, recalling he had an abnormally low serum sodium level. On his, on his renal function panel. So what do we think is the cause for this? Do we think that it's his elevated serum glucose? Do we think that he was drinking so much Gatorade that it caused his sodium to be low? Does this patient have the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion? Or is it his COVID infection that's causing him to have hyponatremia? All right, we have our responses. 79% say that it's the elevated serum glucose. 14% say too much Gatorade. 7% say SIADH, and nobody thought that the COVID was making him have hyponatremia. So the, the correct answer is this elevated serum glucose. And why? Why is that causing him to have hyponatremia? Well, thinking back to pathophysiology, in this situation, the patient's measured sodium does not equal his actual sodium. And the reason for this is that that significantly elevated glucose falsely lowers the sodium report. So we have to correct the measured sodium and there's a formula for this. So for every 100 milligrams per deciliter of glucose above 100, we have to increase the sodium by 1.6 milliequivalents per liter. Now, I just said that, and it sounded like a bunch of gobbledygook. So let's use our patient as an example. So our patient, the sodium is reported at 122. The glucose was reported at 865, which is higher than 100. So we take our glucose of 865 minus 100. We multiply that by that 1.6 milliequivalent per liter, and we get a value of 12.2, which we then add to our measured sodium 
of 122, and we find that the patient's corrected sodium is, is just mildly low at 134. So although the lab says hyponatremia, we can feel confident that the actual sodium is much closer to normal. So we've got this patient with DKA. We've made our diagnosis. We've reassured ourselves that the sodium is okay. How do we manage this patient? And you manage DKA by correcting the acidosis. You do not focus on the blood sugar first. So the acidosis, this is because the body is starving. We don't have that insulin allowing glucose into the cells. And so we have to feed the body with both glucose and insulin. And that's gonna stop that vicious cycle of ketone production. We also need to reduce the hypoperfusion because part of this acidosis, part of the DKA is because of the dehydration. So hydrating our patients is the first step. The acidosis and DKA takes a lot longer to correct than the hyperglycemia. So really focusing on that acidosis is the way that we're gonna uh, to, to, to resolve this condition for our patients. And so rather than stopping insulin, which is gonna restart that cycle of ketone production again, we just add glucose so we can continue to give insulin to our patients. And part of the, the reason we have DKA protocols is that they allow for these flexible mixing systems. So you can really titrate the amount of dextrose in the IV fluids to allow patients to continue to receive insulin to resolve that acidosis. So what fluids do we wanna use? How do we wanna do this? And, and thinking about our patient's fluid deficit is very important. In general, patients with DKA have a fluid deficit of about five to 10% of their body weight or six liters in an adult. Our initial fluid goals are to expand that intravascular volume, giving back the fluids that the patient has lost. And the best way to do this is with isotonic fluids. You can be reassured that you've given enough fluid once the patient starts having urine production. In the first hour of treatment, aiming for about 15 to 20 mLs per kilogram of body weight in a child, or about 1 to 1.5 liters of normal saline in that first hour. And then you look at the patient to see what the next step will be. How do they look? Do they look better hydrated? What are their electrolytes? Are they having urine output? If they're still having hypotension, you want to keep giving back fluids with isotonic fluids like normal saline until their vital signs are stable. If their sodium is elevated or normal, their corrected sodium, you can give a, a slightly less uh, isotonic fluid, a hypotonic fluid of about half saline, normal saline once they're hydrated. If their sodium is low, you want to continue to use normal saline for hydration during the treatment. And then your continuing fluid goals are to replace about half of the water or sodium deficit over the first 12 to 24 hours. Now, now that we've talked about the acidosis, we can talk about the hyperglycemia. We first wanna make sure that the potassium is at least above 3.3. And the reason for this is that insulin pushes potassium into the cells. So if we start insulin without making sure potassium is sufficient, we run the risk of hypokalemia, which can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So we start our insulin after we've given that initial fluid bolus at a rate of about 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. Now you'll notice I mentioned starting at this rate. I did not mention bolusing insulin, and this would be not the right thing to do. We used to recommend bolusing insulin for DKA, but we've discovered that because acidosis is the main thing, you wanna give insulin at a slow, steady rate. If we give a bolus of insulin, that can cause a rapid decrease in glucose, which can precipitate additional um, dangerous effects from DKA that we'll talk about. But we really wanna focus on just starting that insulin at a slow rate and being able to continue without stopping. We wanna monitor our blood sugar every hour and increase the glucose rate or the dextose rate to aim for a drop of about 50 milligrams per deciliter per hour. And our goal of blood sugar while the patient still has DKA is not normal. We want their blood sugar to be elevated so we can continue to give that insulin to resolve the acidosis. Once the blood sugar falls below 350, this is the time you wanna add dextrose to the IV fluids if you haven't done so already to continue to ensure the patient has sufficient fuel to stop that ketone production. 
We also want to think about electrolyte abnormalities in DKA. We touched on a few, the sodium, the potassium, but specifically potassium and magnesium. When we think about acidosis, those positive hydrogen atoms or ions are going into the cell. And in order to make room for them, it's pushing out the potassium and magnesium, which are then secreted into the urine. So these patients need replacement of potassium and magnesium. Phosphate is the other mineral that we wanna pay attention to. And treatment of DKA with glucose and insulin, remember causes the glucose to go into the cells where phosphate then is incorporated into energy into ATP or adenosine triphosphate. So phosphate is also low in DKA and making sure we're monitoring and repleting as needed is incredibly important for management. Other things we need to do, monitor the patient's mental status closely, hourly when they're admitted, and have treatments for cerebral edema available. And we'll talk about the importance of this in a little bit. We also wanna monitor the cardiac status because we mentioned that potassium and magnesium can be affected with DKA and abnormal levels of these can precipitate arrhythmias. We want to avoid central lines if at all possible because DKA is a hypercoagulable state and that increases our patient's risk for DVT. We also want our patients to be NPO for many reasons. First of all, if their mental status is not at baseline, they could choke or aspirate if they're eating or drinking. And also, we want to give consistent glucose through the IV so the insulin can act on that. And adding additional factors with, with oral intake can complicate the management. The other piece is that we know that our patients are dehydrated and hypoperfused, and so adding additional stress on the gut can precipitate ischemia. Once the patient is better, the acidosis, the hyperosmolality resolves, and the bowel sounds return, then, then feeding the patient is something we can think about, but really NPO is the best thing until those two things have happened. So let's talk about our patient. What, what, what ended up happening? Our patient was given many diagnoses, including new onset diabetes, diabetic ketoacidosis, acute COVID infection, respiratory distress, and acute injury, acute kidney injury. So our 18-year-old guy had a lot going on. He was given IV fluids, a bolus of fluids in the emergency room and then started on insulin drip. And then he was admitted to the ICU, both because of his diagnosis of DKA and because of concern for his respiratory status. Remember, he was tachycardic, he was Kussmaul breathing, he was tachypnic, and he was hypoxic on room air. After he arrived at the ICU, he became confused and combative. So... What is the most likely explanation for our patient's change in mental status? The kid's 18, is this just typical teenage behavior? Or does he have cerebral edema related to DKA? Is this related to oxygen deprivation? Or is he having an acute stroke? Which of these things is the most likely explanation? All right, we have some great responses. So, so nobody is like, this is normal for a teenager. 88% say cerebral edema, 12% say oxygen deprivation, and no one thinks he's having a stroke. And I agree 100%, this is cerebral edema until proven otherwise. So let's talk about some of the complications of DKA. Venous thrombosis, like we touched on, to prevent this, thinking about what prophylaxis our patients should have, whether that's Lovenox um, or, or um, the, the, the squeezing devices that we put on our patient's lower legs, and then avoiding central lines, if at all possible, because of that hypercoagulable state. Rhabdomyolysis is another complication of DKA. And this can result in acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia because of the binding of the phosphorus from muscle breakdown and compartment syndrome. Malignant hyperthermia can occur in DKA. And so if our patients have fever and a rising CK level, give dantrolene as soon as possible. And then there can also be a mixed picture. Patients can have both hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state and DKA. And keeping this in mind by keeping an eye on, the, on the, the serum osmolality and the sodium is very important as we continue to manage these patients. So cerebral edema. 
This is the scariest thing because this is the most common cause of death in patients with DKA. 1% of kids, but also in adults. And, and this was not the case in our patient. He didn't end up dying, but, but he did have cerebral edema, which caused a change in his mental status. Cerebral edema is associated with a rapid drop in serum osmolarity. And this is one of the reasons that we don't recommend bolusing insulin is because we cause that rapid drop with insulin bolusing, which isn't as severe if we start an insulin drip. There's some thought that the cerebral edema may be related to cerebral hypoxia and ischemia from the dehydration. So those who answered cerebral um, ischemia or low oxygen content were, were also correct. And so keeping an eye on mental status is incredibly important. Do not sedate patients with DKA if you can avoid it because you really wanna monitor the mental status. If they have headache, that can be a sign of cerebral edema or changes in vital signs, particularly increase in blood pressure or decreased heart rate can clue us in that there might be something serious going on. If symptoms are already present, the mortality rate in cerebral edema is over 70%. And so having a very low index of suspicion and having treatments on hand is incredibly important, especially because imaging isn't really helpful. If you see cerebral edema on CT scan, it might already be too late. So treatment is either mannitol, 0.5 grams per kilogram, or hypertonic saline, 2.5 mLs per kilogram. Treat first, ask questions later if cerebral edema is suspected. So what happened to our guy? Well, thank goodness he was given mannitol for his cerebral edema and he had a head CT which did not have any acute findings. His mental status slowly began to improve and he was continued on our diabetic ketoacidosis protocol with IV fluids and an insulin drip. His labs also began to improve. Sodium, potassium, bicarb, BUN, creatinine, glucose all look much better. And he's no longer acidotic with a venous blood gas showing a pH of 7.33. He's also hungry. And this is important, as we'll talk about soon. So the resolution of DKA, you have to have at least two of the following. Serum bicarb greater than or equal to 15, a pH over 7.3, and a normal anion gap under or equal to 12. So our patient meets all these criteria. What's the next best step in management? Should we discontinue his IV fluids and his insulin and feed him? Should we send him home? Should we transfer him over to rehab? Or should we transition to subcutaneous insulin overlapping with the insulin drip? A hundred percent have answered transition to subcutaneous insulin overlapping with the drip. And I'm, I, I agree, I'm so proud of you all. This is exactly the right answer and we'll talk about why. Um, so with, with diabetic ketoacidosis, acidosis is the most important thing. And so making sure that we resolve the acidosis with the insulin and then continuing to feed the body with insulin and glucose. So if we just stop the insulin and don't give any additional or alternative forms, the patient's going to go right back into DKA. And so making sure the patient always has insulin on board, whether that's IV or subcutaneous, is the way to prevent DKA from recurring. So now I'd like to talk about a couple special considerations with DKA, things that we are going to see in our clinical practice. And this is DKA with SGLT2 inhibitors, fantastic medicine for type 2 diabetes, and DKA with COVID infection. SGLT2 inhibitors are one of the relatively newer type 2 diabetes medications, and they act in the kidney on the SGLT2 uh, receptor. The way that they work is typically sodium and glucose are transported into the cell through SGLT2. These medications inhibit that, 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 that transporter. And so instead, sodium and glucose remain in the urine. And because water follows uh, solutes, they cause a natriuresis, a sodium increase in the urine output, as well as glucosuria. And these two things cause an improvement in hyperglycemia, 
as well as decrease in body weight, decrease in blood pressure. And so they're great for type two diabetes. They lower blood sugar by increasing urinary blood sugar. The problem though, is that they also act very similar to other um, things that increase our risk for DKA. So because SGLT2 inhibitors cause increased glucose in the urine, decreased sodium reabsorption, they lead to increased um, ketosis because they're decreasing that serum glucose, which causes the pancreas to make less insulin and increase glucagon, which causes breakdown of our fat cells, increased free fatty acid production, which go to the liver, which are incorporated into ketones. And so SGLT2 inhibitors cause increased ketosis. This isn't typically a problem unless something else is going on. So if a patient is doing really well on an SGLT2 inhibitor, but develops acute gastroenteritis with diarrhea and vomiting, causing intravascular volume depletion, or runs a marathon and becomes dehydrated, or is in a ketosis prone state like fasting or alcohol ingestion. Maybe they're admitted to the hospital and they're not able to eat or drink normally, or maybe they're having surgery. Any of these things can be precipitating factors for SGLT2 inhibitor induced DKA. The combination of a precipitating factor and the medicine can cause DKA in our patients. So the treatment in general for SGLT2 inhibitor DKA is very similar with a few differences. We still want to volume resuscitate because the patients are most likely dehydrated and volume depleted. And we want to make sure we're restoring that renal perfusion to ensure adequate urine output. Because they're in a relative insulin deficiency state, we do want to start an insulin drip in DKA, but the rate can be a little bit lower because they're not significantly hyperglycemic. So you can aim for between 0.02 to 0.05 units per kilo per hour. But again, we don't turn off the insulin drip until the DKA is resolved. Because the patients are taking an SGLT2 inhibitor, their blood sugar is likely going to be lower on admission than someone who has classic DKA with type 1 diabetes. And so when we're thinking about glucose and dextrose, our target blood sugar can be a little bit lower. Instead of 150 to 250, aiming for 150 to 200 with our dextrose containing fluids is a reasonable thing to consider. And we also want to ensure adequate electrolyte replacement with potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus, just like in any other type of DKA. So let's talk about COVID. This is our two-year anniversary of the COVID pandemic. And COVID has been reported to be associated with acute hyperglycemic crises in inpatients. Atypical DKA, HHS, and a mixed picture of the two have all been described. And there's an increased incidence of DKA in elderly patients and those who have had uncontrolled diabetes at baseline. One of the reasons this is so important to know about is that if a patient with COVID also has an acute hyperglycemic crisis such as DKA, the mortality rate is almost 50%. So keeping an eye out for this and treating it as soon as it's identified can help to improve the mortality rate of our patients. 67% of those have a mixed DKA HHS picture, but almost 30% it's just in DKA. So again, really important to identify and treat. Because this has been reported in so many cases of COVID, there are some recommendations. We know that those on SGLT2 inhibitors are at greater risk. And we also know that COVID precipitates these diabetes emergencies. And so it's recommended that anyone admitted with COVID have blood sugar testing on admission, anybody with diabetes have ketone testing, and stopping any medicines that could precipitate DKA, including SGLT2 inhibitors. If someone is severely sick, thinking about the fluid balance, keeping in mind that COVID is a state of increased uh, pulmonary edema and myocarditis, so adjusting fluids based on the clinical status. If there's a significant amount of patients admitted to the hospital, it might not be possible to use IV fluids or insulin drips, and so thinking about other ways to ensure insulin delivery. And thinking about insulin resistance, we know that COVID-19 not only precipitates hyperglycemic emergencies, but also causes insulin resistance. 
And we've had patients both in the pediatric and the adult ICU with concurrent COVID-19 DKA and HHS needing almost a thousand units of insulin a day. So giving insulin as much insulin as needed is important, not being afraid of those high doses. So thinking back to our patient, how can we decrease the chance that our patient is gonna be readmitted with recurrent DKA? Should we inform him about the long-term complications of diabetes? Scare him, tell him he's gonna lose his eyes and his kidneys and his nerves. Tell him he should test his blood sugar four times a day and give insulin for all of his carbs and all of his high blood sugar values. Tell him that he should live at home until he's 26 years old so his parents can provide his diabetes management. Or should we enlist the diabetes education team, the primary care provider, and the patient's social network to provide support? All right, 94% want to enlist a team, a multidisciplinary um, uh, team of patients, or of patients, of people to help this patient. And 6% want to tell them about the long-term complications. So I agree, it's really important that patients know about the long-term complications, but I will submit that most already do. The readmission rate for DKA is high. One in five patients are gonna come back in with DKA within 30 days after their initial diagnosis or, or after admission. And this is so important because there are so many reasons that this happens. Most of them are related to social determinants of health. Things like socioeconomic status, the age of the patient, their education level, what sort of support do they have? What, what is their income like? Do they have health insurance? What is their ability to get nutrition? And have they had diabetes education? All of these factors play into that readmission rate. And so diabetes is a team disease. It's, it's not just the patient. It requires a multidisciplinary approach, including diabetes education. Yeah, absolutely. Patients need to know why they're controlling their diabetes. They need to know that there are risks, but they also need education about how to eat healthfully and, and, and coordinating their nutrition plan for what they're able to, to afford and obtain in regards to food. They might need social services support. What if they're having difficulty getting to their appointments or getting to the pharmacy to pick up their medications or paying for their medications? We know that the rates of anxiety and depression in diabetes are much higher than in the general population. And so providing mental health support can help to prevent that readmission rate. Public health services, making sure patients have what they need to be able to afford their diabetes medications and supplies. The ability to do labs, both testing their blood sugar at home and, and being able to do labs in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Being able to monitor their glucose. Do they have supplies and can they afford it? Do they know how to take insulin? Do they feel comfortable calculating their doses and giving their insulin? And what is the engagement of their family or their social support network? All of these pieces need to be in place in order for patients to be optimally managed. We can't just blame the patient if we're not playing a part in their management as well. So this has been a lot. And I am so glad that you chose to spend this time with me today. Hopefully we've been able to do some talking about DKA. We've been able to talk about how to recognize it. What are the presenting signs and symptoms? When should we suspect DKA in our patients regardless of whether we're in the office or in the hospital? How do we treat DKA? How do we transition patients from IV to subcutaneous insulin? And, and I think almost most importantly, how do we care for our patients in a whole person care manner? How do we take care of our patients holistically and incorporate that diabetes team so that we can prevent readmission and really help our patients live their best life? So again, thank you so much for having me, for joining me, and I will be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks a lot, Lisa. I really appreciate the presentation. I thought it was great. Um, so I know we have a question that came in in our Q&A. 
So the question says, I have seen uh, physicians treat DKA based solely on the anion gap. Is this general practice? I will say absolutely not. So the diagnostic criteria for DKA, really it's that acidosis, so the pH and the serum bicarbonate level. Anion gap can be elevated in multiple different situations. I think we learned the mud piles acronym in medical school. And so if we only use the anion gap to make the diagnosis or to transition from IV to subcutaneous insulin, we might be missing out on the other pieces that are going on metabolically uh, with our patients. So I would use the bicarb and the, the pH level in addition to the anion gap, but not the anion gap by itself. But one thing that I thought of um, while you were presenting that as a primary care physician um, startled me just a bit. It, tell me why I don't need to fear um, SGLT2s because I know all the good things that can come from them, the, the decrease in the CHF, the um, morbidity and mortality um, is significantly better, et cetera, that they have a lot of good, but if I'm risking DKA, then tell me why I shouldn't be scared. What a, what a great question. Um, the risk of DKA in patients with type 2 diabetes on SGLT2 inhibitors, it's there, it's been reported, but it, it, it's not as high, I think, as the benefits of the treatment. What I do recommend, though, is that patients do not take them if they're in a state where DKA could be precipitated. So if you have somebody who's um, having um, some nausea or vomiting, they're not able to hydrate well, or someone who's being admitted to the hospital is going to be NPO for a procedure, I would hold SGLT2 inhibitors in those particular clinical states where DKA could be precipitated. And then I also educate patients. I say, you know, there is this, this condition of DKA. This is what it is. These are some signs or symptoms. You're on a medicine that's been associated. And even though the risk is low, keep in mind that if you have any of these symptoms, it will be really important to be evaluated. And you can even prescribe urine ketone sticks to your patients, and you can have them test the urine for ketones if they are feeling poorly. And if they find ketones, then going in for treatment sooner rather than later can be a way to, to prevent some of those more serious complications. So um, another question, so is there any sort of diet after someone has been hospitalized for DKA that they should follow specifically? What a fantastic question. I, I love talking about nutrition and I recommend that anybody with diabetes, any other human being. So I, there's nothing post DKA that I would recommend, but what I recommend for everyone, whether we have diabetes or not, is a nutrition plan that really focuses on whole foods. So if you look at the food, it looks like it originated. Apple versus fruit snacks. Uh, baked potato versus potato chips, um, and focusing on those whole foods and limiting things that don't have a lot of nutritional value. So not a lot of processed or prepackaged foods, not a lot of foods with added simple sugars. And then everybody, we really should be staying away from sugar sweetened beverages. So drinking water or non, uh, non sweetened things, staying away from regular sodas and juices and Gatorades and sweet teas. That's really the nutrition plan for everybody, including those who have recently had DKA. I, I generally counseled people to shop the perimeter of the store most frequently. That's where you find things that look like what, what they are. And in the middle, if something comes in a box, then it's not what it started out. Absolutely. And, and another helpful thing is if you can't pronounce the ingredients on the nutrition label, it's probably not something that you should be putting into your body in insignificant amounts. Um, I don't see any further questions. I really appreciate your time. I think this has been super informative and I know I got a lot out of it. So I very much appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.